All right, we're live. Welcome back to another and the final episode of First of All. I'm super excited, super excited, because today's episode is completely dedicated to teaching parents and teachers a new way to really embrace um, student drug use and both at home and within the schools. Um, and it's all about old dogs learning new tricks. Uh, they really can. Um, Throughout the series, we've really been prioritizing and focusing on the adverse and the ineffective effect of punitive policies and of exclusionary po policies and of zero tolerance policies that they really do no good either for uh, young people, for teens, and they really do no good for adults either. Um, punishing a student for drug use or punishing a student for their, their way of coping versus teaching them a new way isn't really effective and is actually very isolating. On the flip side, we see negative uh, policies that impact adults and, and also juveniles sometimes as well, where we see adults who are often criminalized or stripped from the resources that they need to actually do better, or we often see many of the mental health resources that we need monopolized within the criminal justice system. So it's very important that we really take a look at our foundations of drug education and what it is that we continue to reiterate and regurgitate over time. And a great place, um, and the place that we've started at DPA has been in the classroom and it's been with parents and it's really been with, to be honest, giving permission and a giving, giving a new way and giving new language to be able to really embrace the fact that, hey, people do drugs and it doesn't make them a bad person and it doesn't make us better people um, by taking tough love approaches or criminalizing approaches or isolating approaches. So I'm super excited about today because today we have Tammy Olt from um, GRASP. In fact, let me pull her up real quick. We have Tammy Old, who's the executive director from GRASP. She'll talk a bit more about her story as well as um, her organization. And I'm super excited because we have a couple, we have more than a couple, we have a few um, teachers who've actually taught Safety First. One of those is Erin Hilt Brandt Holt. She was actually a Safety First pilot teacher based out in San Francisco. So I'm very excited to have her today and for her to be able to share her experience. We also have Joe Rubin, he's back to speak a bit about um, his own contributions to Safety First and even what it's like teaching right now in the midst of the pandemic and what it's like doing remote learning and doing distance learning and what needs he sees of students and his and their parents and families and also his teachers and co-teachers. And then lastly, we have Mark Williams Jr. Um, he wasn't a pilot teacher, but he does teach at our original pilot school at Bard High School Early College. Um, and what was really cool is I actually met Mark for the first time at a PTA meeting at Bard. And that was when I found out that he had actually taught safety first and flipped it and reversed it in all these ways that I had no clue about. So I'm super excited to have him on. I'm excited about all of our guests. And the first one that I wanna bring in today would be Tammy. Hey Tammy, how are you? Good, thanks for having me. I'm grateful to have you. Um, the work of GRASP is very important um, and it's incredibly, it's incredibly palpable. Um, and so I'm hoping you can tell us a bit about GRASP and the organization's mission. Sure, um, it's actually two, well, the overriding organization is Broken No More. And then um, the subsidiary, uh, subsidiary of it is GRASP, which is, stands for Grief Recovery After Substance Passing. Broken No More is our educational and advocacy group. Um, we have a Facebook page and members all across the world. Um, here we promote scientifically valid information for our members on substance use, addiction, drug policy, and uh, the means to mitigate the harms of substance use for the individual and for society. We support science-based addiction treatment, including the medications buprenorphine and methadone, which are the gold standard treatment for opioid addiction. And we advocate for enlightened drug policy that respects the rights of all. Um, among these policies is the elimination of criminalization, stigmatization, and incarceration of those who use drugs. And we actively oppose the policies of prohibition and the war on drugs. Um, 
We also support the implementation of harm reduction programs, such as syringe exchange programs, overdose training, naloxone distribution, safe consumption facilities. Um, and we support the Drug Policy Alliance, of which we are a partner, um, and their Safety First curriculum to be used in schools um, as a harm reduction-based prevention tool. The grass part of our group is uh, we have a closed Facebook page with over 11,000 members. There were only 400 when I joined um, after my son died in, um, um, eight years ago. So we have grown tremendously during that time. And we also have 125 face-to-face peer-led groups um, throughout the United States and Canada. And we only allow people in the group who have lost someone to substance use. So we've all been there. And this includes parents, siblings, friends, spouses, whoever. If they feel that they're in need of grief support, um, we're there for them. I think that's amazing and critical work. And it speaks a lot about, it says a lot about the growth of the organization that you've seen over the past eight years since you've gotten involved. And so I think it's, it's good to see that there is a space and that that space continues to grow and to be able to hold its members, um, to be able to really um, make it through a very difficult experience that no family member ever you know, wants to be able to experience. Um, so I'm wondering, could you tell us a bit about your personal story and how you became um, involved in the mission of GRASP and Broken No More's work? Um, yeah, my son Joshua died um, April 29th, 2012 from a heroin overdose. He was 16 years old, a sophomore in high school. Um, I'm a physician. I deliver babies. I'm an OBGYN in Peoria, Illinois. And we never dreamed that this would happen to us. We didn't know he was using drugs. It was a complete devastating shock to us. One day he was here and the next day he was gone. And so I immediately started trying to figure out what happened. How could I make things better? Um, I actually took pictures of Josh and his casket because I thought, I know I'm creating a foundation. I know I'm going to do something. You know, am I going to go around and talk to schools and show pictures? Um, and I learned about harm reduction. And as soon as I heard about that, I was right on that. That was, I knew that was the right thing and got involved in that. Um, I contacted Denise Cullen, who's the founder of GRASP and just looking for some way to survive my grief. I really didn't know if I would. Um, and you know, I, I knew at that time you have two choices. You can sit in a corner and cry for the rest of your life or you can get up and do something and make a difference and make sure no other family um, suffers the way we have. So that's when I became involved in GRASP. I started my own GRASP chapter. And then through Denise and a lot of amazing people who are mostly, uh, most of them associated with Drug Policy Alliance, um, learned about uh, harm reduction, the wrong drugs, and all the advocacy things that needed to be done if we were ever going to save lives. Um, you know, we didn't, I didn't know Josh was using drugs. We had no no time to get him help. And that teen code of silence is strong. He probably only used for about, he used for three months, we think from um, September to December, stopped on his own, and then used again in April. And over uh, after a period of abstinence, he used alone in his room and overdosed. My older son found him and basically held him in his arms as he was dying. And um, the ambulance came, the first ambulance did not carry naloxone. Uh, of course, we had no naloxone in the house because it didn't exist in our community at that time. And they lost his heartbeat in the ambulance on the way to the hospital and, and never got him back. Um, so, you know, I've learned a lot over the years. Um, you know, I didn't blame any of the kids for not telling us because um, that, like I said, that teen code of silence is very, very powerful. And, you know, that's one of the things I hope your uh, the Safety First curriculum will help kids understand is, hey, it's okay to tell someone. It's okay if you see a friend struggling with a potentially life, you know, um, 
life ending addiction that it's okay to tell someone and reach out for help. Thank you for sharing your family story and for sharing Josh's story. And I acknowledge that, you know, April 29th was just a few weeks ago. And so I just want to take a, a moment to acknowledge um, Josh. Um, but I guess a question that I would have for you is that you said that, you know, as you were looking for a way to be able to manage grief and to be able to let it out and really be active about doing something, you came across the concept and the framework of harm reduction. Um, could you speak a bit about how you think the framework of harm reduction would be a useful one for parents to embrace so that, like you said, um, their kids could feel more open talking about their drug use or even their friends drug, drug use or some concerns they might be having about how, how they're coping. Yeah, that's, that's a big thing that I've struggled with. You know, I mean, I literally went back and, and from the time Josh was born until the time he, he died and blame myself for everything I did wrong. And I was a dare mom, you know, D Josh was a dare graduate, you know, um, that didn't work out so well for us. We had a dead 16 year old as it hasn't worked out for a lot of our parents in grass, their kids were dare graduates and they're all, and they're all gone. Um, so basically, you know, I started thinking, we, we need to engage harm reduction principles because we have to be honest with kids. I didn't let Josh know. I was so anti-drug. I was just, ju I was a just say no, don't, don't use them. Um, and I don't feel like I gave my um, teenagers the power to speak to me if they were in trouble. Cause I think they were so afraid of being punished or stigmatized or blamed. When looking back, if I could have said to them, I got your back. Nobody loves you more than me. If you're in trouble, let's talk about it. Let's figure out a way through it. I'll tell you, when I read that Safety First book after Josh died I, and the letter that Marsha Rosenbaum wrote, I thought, where was that? Why didn't I have that? I didn't know, you know, the right language to speak to my teens and not to be the just say no mom. That's what we were told, you know. Um, so that, that's why I'm just a huge advocate of, we have to do things different, you know, also the zero tolerance policy where Josh played football. Well, that sophomore year, he dropped out. Looking back, I think, was he afraid he was going to get drug, because drug testing was random. Was he afraid he was going to get drug tested and busted for his drug use? I don't know. I mean, I don't have the opportunity to ask him, but we got to teach the kids to, you know, reach out for help if you do use, um, how to do it safely, how to understand the drugs that you're using, what do they do to your body, how do you look out for each other while using. Um, so there's uh, so, so much work to do. And, you know, the Safety First book was just amazing. And now to know there's a whole curriculum, I mean, it, it will save lives. I absolutely believe that. Thank you for that. And I, be, I believe it will too. Um, and, and when I came into this work, one of the things that I had to be able to approach and deal with is, is that lie that you spoke of, that lie of um, abstinence among all people at all times is achievable, um, that there are certain drugs that we can judge more harshly or certain drug users that we can judge more harshly or we deserve to take away their rights and their dignity and and the potential that they have to contribute to their community because they're using drugs i was fed all of that um but what's very ironic is that you know i was trained in public health and we know that a harm reduction based approach works we know that right Absolutely. and we and and we've done pretty well at admitting that when it comes to sexual health comprehensive sex ed is the gold standard. We recognize that kids are gonna have sex no matter what. Um, even if they wait till marriage, marriage still comes, they're gonna grow up, they're gonna become adults. And you know, we take a lot of pride as health educators in being able to step into that space of teaching kids the skills that they need to be mature and to make safe decisions whenever they're ready. However, a lot of us haven't checked ourselves in that same way when it comes to drug use, because oh, yeah. we, we've also been ingrained with that, you know, a lot of lexicon around abstinence. And that's a lot of the language that we have. And that's a lot of what we share. 
And to be honest, um, when it comes to drugs and drug use, that's actually a space where we can put a lot of our hatred and stigma and disdain for people or for ideas. We've been given kind of carte blanche to be able to lay a lot of um, bias and stigma on drugs and people who use drugs. I got a little winded. There are a lot of long, a little long winded. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to speak to that kind of that lie, you know, that we have to embrace as educators as we embrace a new way and realize that there's a better way to move forward. Could you speak a bit about the experience as a parent where you realize that there's been a schism between, you know, what's real around drug use in the world and kind of what you the, the ideas that may have been instilled in you and maybe you could have been instilling in others? Yeah, well, you know, the minute I read the Safety safety First and the uh, Beyond Zero Tolerance books, I went around to the superintendents of my district and said, oh my gosh, we've got to use this. We've got to back off on throwing kids out because they have a red solo cup in their hand and they're suspended or um, you know, totally removed from school. And um, I was, they're like, okay, but I was pretty much shut down. Um, there, there was no interest in pursuing these policies and letting me speak to um, other parents. Um, and, you know, I just kind of backed off because I knew this was eight years ago and I knew it was going nowhere. You know, by the looks in their eyes and the tone of their mm -hmm. voice that it's not going to happen. And so, you know, I just keep telling my story. I mean, I've done lots of media interviews. Um, keep telling our story over and over and, and, and have that voice um, that yes, it can happen to you. It's all of our children, they all matter. And um, just, just trying to share so people know. And, you know, we were, back at that time, we were headline news when Josh died. Um, it was all over the TV, the newspapers. And I didn't have an opportunity to hide or, you know, try and, not tell my story. But when I was given the opportunity, I said, well, you're not going to tell it as in the media, then I will tell his story. And, and this happened. And we need to do something different. We need to do better. Our, our loved ones are dying. And I just, I just try and be a powerful, strong voice, even when people don't want to listen. You know what? I think that your tenacity and your perseverance is going to pay off in a moment like this because um you know one of the fortunate um but also i think kind of um frustrating things about being in this covid pandemic is that a lot of us that have been pushing for harm reduction based not even just drug policies any type of health policy across the board um all of that is making sense to people now you know that you know punishing people, criminalizing people, not giving people access to resources is not gonna be helpful to anyone. It's gonna cost more money. And, um, you know, it, it's quite, it, it's also quite hurtful as well. And so I think it says a lot about the organizations who've been able to really take the stance that's been true and allow it to remain true in this moment. And then also organizations like yours that have created space for, the necessary process of grieving that comes with losing a loved one. And right now during the COVID pandemic is a very heavy moment for a lot of people. And, I, and I'm not at all trying to make comparisons um, between what's happening COVID and, and losing a loved one to substance use. But there are those of us who are losing loved ones or losing jobs or having mm -hmm. very life-changing um, life changing circumstances happen to us and, and, and it and it takes a lot and it takes community and it takes seeking out those resources. And so I think Broken No More and Grasp has been setting a really good example of that. And I think people will embrace you even more during this time. Yeah, I hope so. We're also um the, one of the other things that I do is with Tolt Foundation, my foundation, mm -hmm. is we are a syringe access program. So we're seeing a 40, 50 percent uptick in overdoses in our community. Um, but we're still on the streets. My outreach workers are still out there getting the locks on out, getting syringes out. Um, but we're seeing, you know, some of the strides we've made in decreasing overdose in our area disappear because of isolation, uh, tainted drug supply. Um, so we're hitting that hard. So that's an, another challenge to, uh, you know, for harm reduction organizations that are on the streets trying to function. Um, 
And it makes it hard when you feel, you know, you feel like you were making a difference and we're just seeing this huge backslide. And it's one of the unintended, I, I don't know, side effects, whatever, of, of the pandemic is, and I think we're seeing it throughout the United States, an uptick in overdose deaths during this time. So it's very disheartening at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's it's disheartening to look at the numbers, look at the stats, both of um, overdoses and COVID. They're both climbing. And, you know, accidental overdose was the number one cause of death um, under the age of 50 in the U.S. last year. And wondering how that's going to look at the end of this year has been such, you know, and again, and we even say ac accidental overdose or even... Um, drug related incidences, right? Because there's so many, um, there's so many factors that can go into why right. someone might overdose or actually die. And I mean, I think even more so now during COVID, it really complicates how we meet people where they're at and, um, you know, keeping them safe. But I see even more now, and I think you see even more out now, how these, how these, inter uh, these um, how these issues intersect. They do. Yeah. They do. So, um, Tammy, I want to take a second. Thank you for all of that. I want to bring you back into the stream a little bit later, but right now I'm going to pull you out because I want to have three phenomenal high school teachers join me right now. First, we have Joe Rubin. Hello. Aaron Hiltbrandt Hall, as well as Mark Williams Jr. Hey, guys. Um, I really appreciate each of you joining because I recognize today is Monday. <laughs> I recognize you guys teach on Mondays. You have a whole job outside of being here. So let's just acknowledge that. Um, and I thank you guys for that. Um, and so one of the first questions I want to ask, and I think that's on everyone's minds, is how have students' learning needs change or how they've been highlighted as a re result of teaching remotely and not being in classrooms? Yeah. Oh. I'll answer that, Sasha. Yeah, please. Um, I think something that I've really recognized is just how interconnected social emotional um, well being is with a person's ability to learn, their motivation to learn. And so much of the feedback that I'm getting from students through various activities that we do is just how isolated they feel, how lonely. And these feelings of depression, the anxiety with the uncertainty of what's going to happen next school year, um, the anxiety of what's happening within their household. And so just recognizing that we, we need to, you know, we need to figure out a way to better have students feel, you know, connected um, and what platforms are going to satisfy um, filling that void of the human connection that we feel when we're physically together in a space. And so that's, I think, been a highlight for me um, with the state of what we're in with distance learning. Yeah, right on. You know, I, I would definitely, I definitely agree. Um, more and more, I mean, right now I'm not, I'm not teaching uh, my usual ninth grade health class and I'm teaching a uh, a kind of upper level advanced health elective. And I still find that, you know, I have to, I'm thinking a lot more about the integration of social and emotional learning into every single unit um, that I'm covering. Like it does not matter what I'm doing. Um, you know, right now we're talking about, uh, you know, death, dying and immortality. And, you know, I'm teaching this class with a cult, with a biologist. And like, we're still thinking about like, you know, talking about death right now in COVID times is, is is dicey so no like we were thinking a lot about you know basic things that we would do in, in you know with our ninth grade students or with our you know our health students you know thinking about in, you know social emotional learning thinking about harm reduction right like i don't want my students necessarily on their laptop on the internet all the time mm -hmm. um, you know so trying to like figure out how to leverage and use those moments when they are going to be on the internet or on laptops um how do i you know make what I'm doing in my classroom just a part of that when they're already there instead of adding extra time, um, you know, to their already quite busy um, day. I just, it's funny, I just saw a funny little meme about, you know, is it seems like there's more work to be done now than when I was in my classroom, inside of my office, in the building. I'm doing way more work uh, than, than, I, than I was accustomed to doing in person, so. Yeah. 
I would add on to about the time element because we have less time and I agree, I don't wanna keep the kids on the computer all the time. So I really have to prioritize what I feel is the most important. And I really feel like this issue, I can't think of something more important actually than giving them actual real information about drugs and, and so on. You can't go anywhere in our society without running into uh, all kinds of messages. And a lot of the messages that students are getting are absolutely wrong. You know, they're wrong and they're also conflicting in a lot of ways as well. Um, so you can get misinformation, but then you might even have, um, which I think is a good thing right now, um, you know, liquor stores and cannabis dispensaries are considered essential services as well. So how do you explain that to children? How do you explain why these services are open right now during a health pandemic if drugs are so bad? So there's a middle ground there that I think that we can work with and, and kids are here with us. And so it's just a, a matter of opening our mouths and letting, letting it be okay to have that, that conversation. Um, I'm curious, how do you guys see that parents and families are coping with their key, their kids at home learning needs and what supports do you think are, are gonna be useful to them right now? I mean, the, the feedback that I get from parents is that they, you know, understandably feel overwhelmed um, and that less is more. So when you're, you know, communicating to them, keep it concise, you know, stick to one email a week um, what are those one to three main points that you want um, or encourage them to support their child with, you know, for that week um, regarding the content that you're covering? And so the feedback I'm getting from parents is less is more, um, but, but still provide, um, you know, links to sources, things that they, they can access should they have the time and they need more of an understanding or they need uh, more information to share with their child. Um, but yeah, the, the theme so far has been less is more. Yeah. yeah I, I, I agree. I've been, you know, I teach right now, I, I, I teach early college students. So the level of independence that they have on their own and also away from their parents is, you know, greater than when I teach my ninth grade students. Um, but even now I'm finding, you know, as I create any assignments, I'm thinking about, okay, what happens if just randomly one of my students can't access internet anymore and like needs to do something or like work with their parent for whatever reason. And now what I've, you know, what I've taken to doing is any assignment or anything that I give out, I make sure like, this is not a kind of dumbing down. I just make sure that anyone will, would be able to pick up that assignment and, and run with it. Right, like at, at any particular level, and that includes parents, right? So, you know, just making sure that when a parent sees something that their, you know, student is doing, that it it not also it not only, you know, is accessible to them, but also it invites them in, right? You know, so intentionally, you know, putting assignments or you know, that, that are optional to some extent. That way, you know, thinking about if individuals have which I which I learned from Erin uh, so wonderfully at a previous talk that we, we got to do together. That some people, you know, just be mindful that some parents and students don't have good relationships, right? So, you know, accounting for those kinds of things and making those sort of things optional. But if it is the kind of situation where, you know, there's a very positive family dynamic in the household, and maybe students do want to get involved with parents, and you know, extending all of what we know as health, you know, educators to parents and inviting them in, adding that to you know, the assignments and stuff that I'm doing, I find it, you know, it really does connect people with, um, with what we're doing and with health in a way that I think they didn't necessarily get when they had health class for sure. So. Yeah, I also think that um, the parents really want us to give information, good information, concise as it was said, but I also feel like with all those messages that are out there, there's still a lot of stuff that isn't being said that hasn't been said and they they really want their kids to have good, true information. And so how would you, so you, you've, you've each worked with the Safety First curriculum, um, possibly also worked with the Safety First booklet for parents as well. How would you encourage parents right now to really embrace a harm reduction based approach 
with their with their child and and I'll open it up, not even just to drug use, but to any form of coping right now. You guys have been talking about social emotional learning. And so we cope in many ways and drug use can be one of many. So what advice do you guys have for parents, or excuse me, for parents and maybe even other teachers to embrace, embrace a harm reduction based approach? I, I would actually say it's, it's really simple. It's way more simple of an approach than people I think realize. Um, you know, you say harm reduction and it's kind of like, it, 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 the curriculum itself has a whole harm reduction unit and says, you know, harm reduction, it's like it has the activity. What does it literally mean? Um, and doing that, and, and I definitely want to highlight the uh, alcohol activity, right? With pouring liquid from the graduated cylinder and stuff like that. That activity, blew, I, it blew my mind as to how simple it was as far as harm reduction goes but also how integral it was for students to actually understand like drinking the, how much you might drink when it comes to beer is definitely not how much you want to drink when it comes to something like vodka, right? That's going to be a very bad night for anyone, everyone involved, uh, right. you know, that kind of, and that, and that's harm reduction, but that's an activity that can be rearranged for all grade levels, you know, for, and you know, for dis for discussion with parents, for being run with individuals, and that that in and of itself is a way of thinking about how you can do harm reduction, you know, at home, right? It does. It's not something that you necessarily need to to get a, a graduate degree, and not that you know that doesn't make it even better and more enriching, but it is really something that is for every single person in some way, shape, or form, and it does not require you know, massive technological capacity or skill. It doesn't require this like extensive drug knowledge. That's the whole point in, in, in a way, right? So that, that that's my kind of, you know, advocacy piece for, for the whole approach of harm reduction. Yeah, and I would add to that, that for, for parents to, um, to recognize that, that teens are really hungry for information and they, they want, to talk, they want to have a conversation. And there could be times, and I know there's times when a parent tries to engage their teen in a conversation and the teen may shut down or they may not be willing to be very open about what they're thinking. But just knowing that there is a supportive adult there that cares for them speaks volumes and they know that they can come to you if needed. But um, to, to specifically address like harm reduction, and that emotional component that's involved with harm reduction. And what I love about Safety First is that um, it allows an opportunity, that, that space for people to really consider um, that the term set and setting that's used in the curriculum, you know, quite often, but, you know, why do you feel the way you do? What are some things that are driving you to feel that way? Um, why are you wanting to potentially use a substance um, what is your setting? You know, would you be safe if you were to use a substance? Do you have a support person? Um, and to kind of think really big picture, which I think is is huge and important um, for you know for for teenagers to to address to think about. And so having parents, caregivers, you know, be open and and having conversation, you know, with with their teens, with their students, um, I think contributes to better overall just kind of emotional well-being for that child and yeah. safety first does that safety first yeah. is great about that yeah yeah i think in terms of convincing parents that this is the way to go um my my first thing is always that people make better decisions based on knowledge than on ignorance because i know there's a tendency to just say oh don't worry about that don't, don't ever deal with that that's all you have to know mm -hmm. um but kids are actually, as Aaron said, very thirsty for knowledge. And if they can't come to you about it, they'll go somewhere else and no saying whether that's going to be good information or not. So it's much better to be upfront and tell the truth so that kids will always trust you. Because if you start lying to kids, they're going to figure it out and then they're not going to want to hear anything from you. So you just right. tell them the truth. And that's what harm reduction is. It's just truth. You know, and I think, again, this moment is a great moment to tell the truth, but I think it's also a very, it would be a very complicated moment to double down on the lie of abstinence and of 
you know, achieving complete prohibition, um, especially again, as young people are having to cope in their own ways and some may very well be using drugs or not even them, people around them or their family members. Just, we have to acknowledge the fact that we are in communities and it's not just about us anymore. And public health is such a great way to show us that, but the ways in which we are able to cope based on the skills that we have or even the resources that we have, it's, it's important to be, um, aware of what's available to us, aware of what's available to other people and kind of where there's a disconnect between what people need and what they have. Um, and so another question that I have for you guys is what advice or what suggestions would you give to teachers or to schools or to districts or administrators for next school year? So if we're anticipating having um, students who might, you know, have had developed coping skills that traditionally have been punished or um, let's say acting out, let's say drug use, a lot of different ways. And we know they'll have increased socio-emotional learning needs. What advice would you give to teachers and to schools in preparation for next school year? I'm gonna break tradition and go first this time, but I think that um, zero tolerance is basically zero education. You're just saying, I'm not dealing with the problem, go away. And we are educators. Our job is to educate. And that's just uh, to getting rid of our responsibilities. And so that's not the way to go. We need to educate people. If there's anything that we can do to help reduce their harm, we're there to help make them live a better life. We're not sitting there to pass judgment on someone. And when you do that, when you, you know, tell people, oh, people who use drugs are bad, basically, you know, people, the students that I have, um, you know, there's a stereotype that people are using drugs because they're all just irresponsible and they don't care about anything. And a lot of them are dealing with trauma. Mm -hmm. And it's not maybe the best way to deal with trauma, but that's what's going on. And if we don't address that and we just say, OK, all people who use drugs are bad, then basically what we're saying is that I'm writing off this population of students in my class. And, yeah, the ones who never touch drugs or experience anything can pat themselves on the back and feel really good. But the rest of the students are going to block you out and have nothing to do with you and not really care about anything you say because they have family members and they love their family members. And maybe they use drugs and maybe they're not bad people. So they already know you're lying. So I really think it's important that we make our policies fit our job, which is education. Very well said. Yeah. I second all of that, Joe. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, I would, I would also add to that that um, you know, as educators, we have we have a responsibility, of course, as Joe said, to educate, but to create an environment that's that's comforting, that's you know welcoming, that's inclusive to our students. And something that we often discuss in class is is stigma, um, stigma and shame. Mm -hmm. And until you know, we as a society are ready to have conversations and not just one-off conversations, but consistent conversations about why a person is making the decision that they are that may or may not be the best decision for their health. But until we start having these conversations and allowing people to feel comfortable in sharing, you know, what they're dealing with, um, why they may be using a substance to self-medicate, um, you know, I, I, I really encourage educators to consider, you know, a program like Safety First because it's it's rooted in conversation. It's rooted in developing, um, you know, empathy and ultimately just, you know, reducing the stigma of substance use and abuse and mental health as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I would I would also add to that, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything uh, Joe and Aaron and Aaron have said. But I would also add, this is one of the first things that I've seen that actually combines public health as a discipline and field with health education, right? And I, I think often I, I tend to fight this battle of, you know, health education is not a separate field onto itself. It is a it is a subset. It is a, in the same way that you know you have environmental health, you have you have epidemiology, you have biostatistics, sociomedical sciences. You know all these things. You have health education, right? And I find sometimes that in you know the health education arena, 
you know, people are kind of getting uh, some, you know, a, a little taste of what is happening in public health schools. And the public health folks are like doing their academic research, you know, they're doing their praxis and stuff. And it's not be, it's not getting talked to. There's no crosstalk. So this for me was the first moment where I could say, wow, here's this 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 very realistic, this very honest drug education curriculum based in the principles and all the things that you find, you know, when you get an MPH or a degree, you know, that's in a public health field. And now I can use it in the classroom in translatable ways. Like I, you know, I was not a, my, my colleague at my school, he was the, one of the, the pilot teachers for, you know, the DPA curriculum. And he comes from human sexuality training, right? And community health education training. You know, I come from, you know, anthropology training and, and you know, all the social science disciplines and public health stuff. And so to finally have something where I could take these wonderful points, I didn't use the whole thing, I didn't use everything, you know, in, a, in, in the way that it was given, but I used more resources in this than I thought I was actually going to, right? And it, like, that's the kind of stuff that I think we need to be doing a lot more of is this integration of these fields. Mark, that means a lot. <laughs> that means a lot, and thank you because you're you're exactly right, and I think people um, are seeing that more and more. Um, I spoke a bit on a couple episodes ago about my own career trajectory. You know, I pursued public health, but I was very much interested in educating young people. And so as I get into the classroom, I realize how there's a disconnect, a lot of overlap, but also some real disconnects between what you learn in public health and education, even though you have the exact same goals. So to hear that we really met in the middle and we found that with Safety First, that means a lot because I do think that that is gonna be, I think that's gonna be more of the wave moving forward. I don't think we can continue to be so separate. It's not working well. And I, and I do even see here in New York where they're making more effort to make sure that high school health educators are able to get um, the certification that they need and actually do it at no cost at this point. And that wasn't the point when I was a high school teacher, I would have had to pay to go, to go back to school. Um, so you've, you've hit it on the head. And I, I wanna piggyback on your question around um, integrating issues and really integrating the different facets that go into life and really just kind of like your local community, to be honest. And so, one of the things that I think we're all excited about is now being able to take safety first that's meant for being taught in person and adapting that so that students as well as parents could be able to actually use the resource online um, and be able to check it out that way. And so some questions I have for you guys is how do you think is the best, what are just, what do you literally, being a nerd, picking your brain, what do you think are some of the best ways that or even resources or platforms or online tools that will help um, students connect with this type of material, but also help them engage with their parents or their siblings or whoever's at home with them. I, well, I would, I, I'm super excited, Sasha, that, that Safety First is being adapted for distance learning. Um, so I very much appreciate that and I'm excited about that. Um, one thing I, I, I will say is that not every student may feel comfortable in engaging in conversation with people in their household about these topics, just given the realities of their, their household. They could be living with a substance abuser um, or something else that um, has some sort of you know, traumatic impact on their you know, well-being. Um, and so what I, what I think about, what is great about Safety First is that it, it, it can be adapted to any household. So should a student um, want help, want resources, want information about substance use and abuse, um, and they may be in an unsafe environment, um, it can give them a sense of um, maybe confidence or feeling a little bit empowered to maybe not feel so helpless and maybe try to contribute and help. Um, the, the substance user abuser in their household, um, but doing it in a way where, you know, it's, it's asynchronous and they're able to, you know, look at the safety first information on their own. But to your point of, you know, opening up conversation with households where, you know, parents, guardians are um, very open and willing to engage in conversations with their child, I think safety first lends itself really well to that. 
Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see where your curriculum will be headed with these adaptations because um, I think it's just going to be able to to reach any type of student in any type of household and that student is going to feel um, empowered and uh, feel a bit more confident and then just of course more knowledgeable in their decisions um, regarding substance use and abuse. Thank you. I, I really liked the part of the curriculum which asked students to really think about drug policy and to kind of critique it themselves to decide if they agree or disagree with the drug policy. And I kind of like, I took some of that um, attitude towards, you know, questions about vaping and as opposed to smoking. And so what I, I like to do is give students uh, a chance to voice their opinion based on facts and information that they do research. So I really liked when they made, I had them make their own videos with Adobe Spark about, you know, what their policy was, what their, if they were the Congress person and they were getting to set the rules, what would they do? You know, cause really that's what we want. We want to empower them to have their voice heard and make sure that, that, that they take the responsibility of making it not just something flippant, but that they actually research what they're saying, but that, that they have a voice. Um, so that's what I like. That's how I see it going forward. So I have a follow-up question. So did you have them, I'm talking about your activity, did you have them record themselves as Congress people and kind of deliver what would be their policy solution? I gave them a choice. I said they could either be the older brother or sister of someone who sees somebody vaping and, you know, they say, wow, well, that looks cool. What should I do? You know, or they could be the Congress person that decides should they restrict vaping or should they make it more accessible as a, as a harm reduction strategy? What do they think? And um, they, they chose, a lot of them chose to be the congressperson, um, a lot of images. And they didn't necessarily have to video themselves. They're a little shy about that. Adobe Spark makes it so you can make it like a, almost like a video PowerPoint. You know, you don't have to necessarily be in the video if you don't want to. But they were powerful. They were really well done. And it was all over the map. You know, it's not everyone agreed, but that's okay. It's, it's good to have people, you know, have their point of view and know how to express it in a way that uh, is attractive to other people and they can hear it. Yeah, for, um, for me, I, I tied, uh, I found that the, the curriculum really opened up a lot of space for, um, you know, for last semester when I, I taught an elective from some of the other college students on a uh, like human uh, human health ideas and various things, and we had a unit on uh, on the opioid epidemic, addiction, various things like that. And you know, I had my students think a lot about um, harm reduction, you know, critical harm reduction. You know, what does it mean when we talk about harm reduction? You know, what might be the the kind of overlooked elements? Um, they put together. Uh, they read this wonderful book called Righteous Dope Fiends, and they put together um, some some policy. Uh, suggestions so like mobile clinics and various things like that to, to help deal with you know the opioid epidemic but they had to use you know a significant amount of you know what we learned about addiction and like neurobiology and various things like that and i, I was i was lucky to teach this class with a neurobiologist so it added that like the weird richness of you know what does it mean when we talk about addiction you know what are the various that everyone doesn't even agree necessarily that addiction is a biological condition right like you know, we, we talk a lot about those various things, you know, something that I really did enjoy about the curriculum is that it really does lay a good foundation for you to build and scaffold and do all of these neat ideas and like think about, um, you know, really tune it to grade level, to audience, you know, to, for different multimodal or multimedia, um, multimedia based, um, you know, approaches to drug policy. And I, I, I would, I want something like this for basically all of my drug, all of my units, like all units, that would be great. Uh, another thing for me that I did with my ninth grade students, I wanted them to um, to have a lot of notes. So if four years from now or five years from now, they wanted to be like, ah, oh, I knew we talked about psychedelics. What was it? So they had at least as they, and you know, I had one student, you know, she wrote 11, she had 11 pages worth of notes from the units. And I was like, okay, great. And they, like, I just had them rewrite those notes over and over again so that later on in life, they could come back to their drug, you know, their drug education notes and be like, okay, I definitely don't want to mix 
you know, my anti, my, my depressants with my alcohol. I definitely don't want to do that. Right. So like that, you know, those are just some things that I, that I thought about um, when you asked your question. And Sasha, I, please, I was just going to say one, one activity that students love with um, Safety First is taking our conversation and what we've learned beyond like our four walls of the classroom and yeah. spreading those messages across our school community. And so last semester, they basically designed, you know, little posters um, with various harm reduction strategies. And we put those all around the school. And so, you know, taking that activity now that we're not in school, but remote learning, and the reach that they can have that's even broader in their community through social media. Um, so I think there's a, there's just a lot of opportunity with Safety First um, to take conversations um, and information beyond a classroom or beyond their household to you know kind of their greater communities. And so that's something that we're excited uh, to do here shortly. Yeah, it makes me excited to hear about the poster. Like I'm always excited when I hear about what other people are doing with the curriculum because I'm so set on what the standard 15 lessons are. So anything creative is mind blowing to me. Um, but I think you guys really hit it on the head. I think that there's a lot of ways in which Safety First can be adapted for different audiences or for different learning modalities because I also think there's a lot of stuff that people just don't know. So there's a ton of information that hasn't been accessed yet uh, by most people who are learning through Safety First. And I think there's a million different ways that we could come up with to really be able to deliver and share the information. And I, I think what you're saying is right, Erin, right now is such a great opportunity to really look at the different ways in which we can facilitate and help um, propagate this information because we're at home, we're now losing, using online um, platforms and, um, yeah, I think we're in our natural habitat in, in many ways, it, which, what is now our natural habitat in many ways. And so we have to find ways to really be able to work within it. Um, that said, I want to bring Tammy back into the live stream. I'll see you. Oh, I thought we were going. No, you guys are staying with all of us now because I've got questions for all of you. Um, the first one being, how do you think that educating a generation of young people in harm reduction-based drug education would influence the way that we treat our family members and those closest to us who are having an experience with problematic substance use? Um, I, I can answer that because I've had to learn so much about it. And I do have a very close family member um, in recovery. So through all my harm reduction educa education and learning over these past years, um, it helps us to be able to understand, to stop judging, to support them, um, especially with medication assisted treatment, which, you know, has been shown to keep people alive and um, healthy. So I just, I think it's just, if we could start people out, kids and parents, as you guys were talking, I was just thinking we have this continuum and the prevention, the harm reduction model for teens has been missing for all these years and some sort of education for parents. So if we can incorporate teaching our teens harm reduction, explaining harm reduction to parents, then as we move along with people who have problematic drug use and we need support from communities for harm reduction programs, because believe me, there's a lot of uh, people against it. You know, I was told I'm enabling because I run a syringe access program. Why would you hand out syringes? Why would you give out cookers and cottons and all the things they need? And then we have people that actually get to treatment and there's stigma against that. They, you know, you hear people say, oh, well, you're just substituting one drug for another. Well, no, it's literally life-saving. So if we could start out with this really good program for our teens to learn and understand and parents to get some education, it's gonna help the whole continuum of drug use. And with such a good foundation, I, I really believe we'll save more lives. We'll be able to get harm reduction um, programs into communities. You know, there are still states where syringe access is illegal. So we've got to change thinking from the very basic level. Very well said. I agree. And just increasing empathy. Yeah. I think that that a harm reduction approach, and um, you know, you had, you had mentioned had asked about 
students who are living in households with substance users or abusers and how harm reduction and drug education approach, you know, may may impact a, a relationship. And I think just um, developing more empathy um, and an understanding for why their family member may be engaging um, in drug use um, and, and not being so um, quick to judge, to shame, um, I think is a huge benefit to a harm reduction approach. Yeah. And I, I, I would even, I would, I would also add, I mean, just literally like, this is it's funny because i i just talked about like the need to bring multiple like you know just to actually do the allied health sciences thing correctly in full form and as i look here and i'm like okay there's a diverse group of people right here in terms of like life professional you know affiliation we have doctors and teachers you know public health professionals you know policy folks it's like the collect the, the collect collective knowledge base right now is is absolutely incredible. And if like, these kinds of things, like these moments of live streaming of coming together, of actually talking about, you know, these issues openly and honestly and thinking through what we can do, how we can deal with it, right? Like bringing this at the community, doing this at the community level is what we need, right? Like that empathy that, you know, Aaron was talking about and, you know, to, to what you were talking about as, as, as well, Tammy, like that, you have people on the one side who are like, no, don't give the syringe exchanges, don't do that. And on the other side, you're, like people are also shaming folks for treatment. It's like, how how do you expect, so do you just want people to die and, and move on? Like, is that where, you know, asking and very honestly those kinds of questions, you know, that's, for me, the future in, in thinking about these issues is really about how do we leverage all of our combined expertise and professionalism, right, at the community level, right? We, teachers, teachers will listen to us, I, I imagine, you know, like that's, we, you're giving them a curriculum, they're like, oh, wonderful, this is, I can just take that and go. Uh, you know, but it, it's really that, like, those policy activities, when we, talk, when we go to the community level, you know, having to convince, you know, I found myself yesterday just not even about drugs, having to tell a family member why vaccines do not cause autism and are actually good for you. Right, like the same is the same kind of energy that we put towards, you know, for you know vaccines and you know the anti-vaccine movement. That that's the kind of energy that we need to do that we need to take when it comes to drug policies. Right, that you know zero tolerance is not the way to go about it. That this is a syndemic. Right, that what happens when it comes to drugs is not in isolation. It's tied to questions of race, of gender, of of geographic location. If you live in a rural area or an urban area, right. Like the fact that now I have students who walk around with, with Narcan in their bags, right? Like, and just who, I, I got to tell them you can't have that, but you know, I love that you have it, right? Like that's the changing, you know, making that the norm. That's where we are in the business right now, you know, changing culture. So. As an educator, I think Mark really hit on a lot of things, but for me, it's, it's about, um, do we feel like people are expendable? Are we going to sit there and say that that these people are not worth anything or we're just going to sit there and judge or we're going to actually do something that helps that makes it so that they can live a healthy life. And if we if we teach our young people that people are expendable, then we don't have really a great future ahead of us. We have to tell them that no one's expendable, that we care about everyone. And with again, with all of our different kinds of knowledge, we need to put that together and make solutions. Great. I think he hit it on the head. And so I want to recognize that we're at the hour and all of you have incredibly important other things to do. And so I want to go ahead and get into our episode takeaways. So I think you guys really hit it on the head. And the first one is that now more than ever, it's important for it's important to empower teachers, parents, and students to embrace a harm reduction approach to drug use. And what empowerment looks like is actually giving the skills to do so, actually giving the language to do so, and then giving the space to both practice the language and skills that are affiliated with a harm reduction-based approach. And you know, as everyone spoke to earlier, what harm reduction could look like in a classroom was a bit nebulous in the past. You know, most people tend to affiliate the term harm reduction with syringe exchange or syringe access, but that's not what that looks like in a classroom. What harm reduction based drug education looks like is your typical comprehensive sex ed 
I don't want you to do anything that's gonna put yourself in harm's way, but I recognize that you're human. You're gonna make your own decisions and you're gonna grow. And sometimes those decisions aren't gonna be the best, but here's how you can navigate that throughout your life. And I'm gonna trust that you're gonna make the best decision because I've given you the best information. And ideally I've empowered you to be able to make safe decisions. Um, and tough love isn't always the answer. You guys just, you know, Joe, you just made a great point about people being expendable. And I think that that has been a habit and a pattern that we have, especially within the US, is we, you know, definitely make people expendable. We have the largest and most expansive prison system of, of any nation. And so that's what we do. We very much make people go away. We're okay with that. Um, but that doesn't work. Locking people up doesn't help curb drug use or drug sales. Um, it hasn't helped mitigate the overdose crisis. Um, and it doesn't help to alleviate the trauma that people experience as well. In fact, it helps to exacerbate it. So especially as it relates to health or trauma related decisions that people make, compassion and harm reduction prove to be the most effective approaches. It might feel ass backwards sometimes, but actually, compassion gets you pretty far. And lastly, education is really our first and best line of defense. You need to make sure people actually know the truth and just don't have really quippy sayings like just say no, or I'm too cool for drugs, or you know, drugs are criminals, or again, bring back out the frying pan with the eggs and this is your brain. Like all of that stuff was really quippy. The dare shirts were cool and a lot of people still have those, but we need quality education. We need comprehensive harm reduction based education that again, acknowledges the fact that abstinence among all people at all times is completely unattainable, a waste of time and a waste of money to even try to achieve that goal. Um, and if you give proper education, it's actually gonna help us better understand and advocate for effective public health policies, for effective um, educational structures and for effective school discipline policies that actually help um, restore um, the school community and also restore a student's sense of belonging to that school community instead of isolating. And this is all made incredibly clear by the COVID-19 pandemic. Again, um, we speak about mental illness when it comes to young people as an issue of um, if, whether than when. And COVID has made it very clear that we all have something that we have to cope with and something will come up over your life. And so it shows that there's always times at which we need to access mental health resources, health resources, the health system in general. And we really need to be honest with young people about how to access that, what resources are available to them and really what are the best policies that are gonna keep them and their loved ones safe. So I wanna thank Everybody who's here today, Joe, Aaron, Mark, Tammy, thank you so much. Um, so much thank of you, what Sasha. you do is at the crux of why we have Safety First, why we put so much energy and effort behind it, because we really do believe in it. Um, so just thank you. Thank you for everything that you've contributed to making the curriculum as awesome as it is, for piloting in your classrooms and going through the craziness that that was, figuring out how to modify the lesson so that this can actually work for all people everywhere. And I think that we've really set a good foundation and a good um, a good way um, for other people continue to, to continue to join us and blaze along this path and really um, embrace a new way. So I'm really, really thankful to each of you, genuinely. Thank you. It's Thank great you. working with Thank you. you. Thank you. To everybody who's watching and who watched the whole series, thank you. This has been a blast. I hope it's also been incredibly informative. I want to thank everyone from DPA and Made of Millions who helped bring this together week after week. I want to thank the graphic designers, Gabby, Gabriella and Anastasia who helped bring all these awesome graphics together both on socials and on the live streams. Everyone who made it happen, thank you so much. And um, let's stay safe, let's stay sane and let's stay healthy and well, so. Everyone take care. All right, you too. Thank you. Bye.